Ta. Um, maar wat ik eet dan nou het Jerry. Um, maar wat ik eet, maar nou het ook heel gewoon chillig. Want ik kwam met hem. Toch nou het dan maar jodig aan het. Hij moet maar op die chukschot naar te bepaald. Ik kan dat dat nu ook chip kan dat met potje. Department of Linguistics. Abe. University of Arizona that to get up American Indian Language Development Institute. And the Biawar Shachim Chui met up and that meant the Ajiwa Yehap Ida Hajiwadika Idam Isleta Pueblo Up Cham Judita Mata Sahaba Juk it mark safta hat kita President Luhan moya amju dat siki kami itu mataju wadika moya atsku gitu wadia ha. And the bap pochum cuy macapan tahat macam banyuai itu nawaj ine slaughter mencari amju ni kumu itu tahat. And sab aju mencari inako kebihi ko amju cukron amju. An pelajar itu mempunca baju ko hari amawah apa yang saya gohom hari cakap pasar skok sim nanti pia batawa mat mukam jodohi ya wajah tum nakok ya wajah junik tapi ya wajah junik kerana syarat sebabi kai cohi kam jodoh cipta junik pun tumu mat mukai ihi ke si adik. Good morning, my name is Ophelia Cepeda and I'm very happy to be here and. I appreciate uh, the introduction by my friend uh, uh, Jerry and also for the invitation by my friend uh, Ines Slaughter. We go uh, way back, as Jerry said, in all of our work and our uh, interest, of course, in, um, in uh, what I always just called uh, language work or efforts in, in um, language maintenance and revitalization and in some instances documentation. I bring greetings from the southern part of Arizona, Tohono O'odham country, and also I uh, express my appreciation for being allowed here on the lands of um, Isleta Pueblo, and of course my appreciation for the welcome and uh, uh, prayers by uh, President Lujan. Um, so. When Inde invited me to come um, to present um, at this year's symposium, uh, it was um, the topics that she was talking about to me at first, you know, because I've been in, in this area of work for such a long time. Sometimes I think about it and, um, uh, and the things that I've seen in regards to, to language change especially, it's just been phenomenal. Um, the things that have happened and the things that are happening now with the language and, of course, the efforts currently ongoing. Um, anyway, so the topics that she offered me, at first I thought, oh, you know, these are topics that are sort of overdone. Everyone's, you know, talked about them before, so I wasn't sure how uh, interested an audience would be. Um, but one of the things that she mentioned, which I was slightly surprised, I think it's possibly because of the way she worded it, and um, and I don't I don't uh, expect that any of you in the audience would be of this opinion. That is, Inez said to me that one of the reasons she asked me to address this particular topic, um, learning a heritage language, and its correlation with children's success, especially in school. And the reason she wanted me to address it was because she said there are parents out there. And like I said, I'm sure you are none of those parents. She said there are parents out there that have a fear or sort of anxiety about having your children in especially language immersion programs because it may affect their English skills. Now, over the years, even before native language immersion programs started, we had lots of bilingual programs in the 60s, 70s, and 80s for native languages, but also Hispanic uh, communities especially. 
and others. The data from those, that particular experience in that era shows, you know, that that is, is completely false. That is, that being bilingual or knowing your own language and then learning English, either alongside or slightly after, um, is, can be a natural process. And that it does dimin that, not, that knowing a second language or learning a second language doesn't diminish your ability or skills in the English language. So anyway, when she said that, that then that's what she said. She said there are parents that um, are afraid of sending their children to these language programs because it'll affect their abilities in English. And of course, that extends to their ability to succeed. Now that sounds very, very familiar. That has been part of our history for a long, long time. You know, it's a, it's a mindset of some of your parents and some of the grandparents of people a little bit younger. So it's an interesting phenomenon. So you have to think, well, maybe it is the case that language immersion programs are working so well that it is actually doing that. That is placing that fear in, in some parents or else there are groups out there that are again putting that fear in parents about second language learning or learning your heritage language. So we, don't, we really don't know what the information is on that. That is, we haven't talked to, I think, enough parents to make um, uh, an evaluation of that. So what Inea wanted me to do is just look at some uh, of the information out there regarding children's success and learning their heritage language. And so um, I've just put some, a few things together here for you this morning. But it is a very interesting topic. Um, some of my information and uh, what I know about um, heritage language and success in schools is based on a large study that we did between 2001 and 2006. And it's called the Native American Language Shift and Retention Project. And it was funded by the U.S. Department of Education, uh, their Institute of Educational Sciences. So it was a substantial uh, study and was to the populations we looked at was to represent populations, native children populations across the United States. And um, uh, we looked at children on reservation schools, public schools, um, charter schools, also schools in urban settings that serve Native American children. The Investigators included myself and my colleagues, Dr. Teresa McCarty and Mary Eunice Romero. Um, it was, uh, like I said, a substantial study and one of our main goals was, of course, to collect data from all of these populations that were going to be part of the study, collect enough information so they themselves also could sort of look at their situation uh, with um, uh, language shift and retention or success of children in schools and plan on their own to remedy any issues or else build on the strengths. So as you can see, the study's been over for quite some time now and um, the schools know their status based on our study and some of them have take, uh, taken action, uh, like I said, to remedy or build on their strengths. So. Uh, we found it a very um, successful uh, project overall. Our information was collected by um, interviewing students, teachers, parents, looking at curriculum, looking at test scores. Um, uh, of course, we talked with administrators and their goals, looking at the school's goals and policies regard, regarding language and so forth. So it's a typical, you know, sort of large encompassing study, and that's why it was a long one. Um, the thing is that this particular study did not do a real uh, extensive um, uh, uh, look or uh, uh, 
it didn't have a, a big element on, on numbers, if you will. And that's why we used the um, uh, information that was available on standardized testing and, and so forth. And so some of our outcomes were based on those uh, reports by, by the school and the State Department of Education. So anyway, so that report is, is out there because it is um, a federally funded uh, project and so you can um, seek it. And uh, at the end I'll have um, uh, some recommended resources uh, regarding that particular study. So most of the, the publications that um, McCarty and, and uh, Romero Little and I did are uh, just short uh, articles and book chapters and so forth. And so I have a list of them at the end as well among uh, other people. Anyway, um, I wanted to start out, of course, um, because, as I said, I'm sure no one in this audience is, is of uh, the mind that it is harmful to learn a second language, especially to learn your own language. And so I'm sure that this particular quote from one of the, the parents um, is one that you will um, identify with in general and in general about language learning and perpetuating um, cultural practices. And it's interesting that this um, parent says, you know, um, that this is the least that they can do uh, as far as helping the student identify themselves and, and she's identify themselves and, when, and you can see we put in native and, and um, that's sort of what she was alluding to but never said it. She didn't say anything about that specific tribe. She just says, you know, this large, um, uh, more general identification of being native. And uh, like I said, it was her opinion about what language can do. From that study, because we interviewed so many uh, youth, because it was uh, a study on, on, on youth, um, we found young people who spoke their language, high school age people who spoke their language and learned it as children. And, and it's, it's these children that... Um, are raised in extended families that included the grandparents and parents all as uh, first language speakers of their, their heritage language. And so you can see where a young person who was in high school maybe, uh, well, during the study uh, would know their first language as, um, you know, as, as their language uh, present day. And uh, you can see the things he lists for himself which one we rarely hear, I think, and that no, you know, uh, it's no way to, to measure or quantify where he says, you know, it gives him that um, ability um, to respect himself, to respect myself. And of course, we hear the one about respect my culture and my language. Those are the two we hear most often, but the one about respecting yourself as an outcome of being a speaker of the language is something that we, we rarely hear. And so they still, you know, it's still a part of him, uh, even, even as a, a high schooler in 2002. Um, I do want to um, preface my um, uh, upcoming slides to let you know that most of the information from this slide, these slides come from a paper that was um, uh, produced by, again, my colleagues, um, Teresa McCarty and uh, Mary Eunice Romero, uh, coming out of their uh, Language Policy and Planning um, Institute at Arizona State University. And it's a very nice, nice paper um, done in 2006. And, um, they um, did an overview of language immersion programs, uh, just a, a small number of them actually, and provided some of the outcomes regarding um, the benefits of uh, studying and or knowing your heritage language. So let me begin with some definition. 
definitions just to set. And I don't want to go too far back with definitions only because, you know, you all are uh, in the field already, so I don't want to reiterate things that you're already familiar with. And I know other people are going to cover some of the, the topics um, in this area anyway. But real quickly, I just wanted to provide our, um, a definition taken from uh, sociolinguist Joshua Fishman uh, regarding uh, language shift. And of course, we know that it's something that occurs gradually over many years and that, that it can be caused by both internal and external uh, influences. And you all know that based on your own community. Each community is going to vary, so we can't point at one um, particular uh, cause. Um, and we know, you know, this general uh, definition, you know, regarding, a, he uses the word abandoning. Maybe you don't want to use that word, you know, because it's sort of a, a loaded word in general, but his definition inclu includes that, abandoning, um, say, your native language in favor of a language with higher status, um, especially English, and in, in other uh, countries it'll be another uh, major language, as in Mexico, uh, Spanish, for instance. Um, and then eventually, you know, you move um, to where the native language has less and less importance and prestige. Um, so, so that's sort of where we're going to be coming from. So the other thing is, and here we're just talking about the general uh, sense of being bilingual uh, and uh, adopting uh, another language. So he states that two things can occur when one starts or is bilingual. That is, both languages can be there for distinct purposes uh, or otherwise one replaces the other. Um, and you can sort of perhaps do, those of you who think of yourselves as bilingual, sort of the process that you either are going through now or went through uh, or know others who are going through uh, currently. So one thing, too, that um, Ine mentioned was my own uh, experience. And I just, meant, I just lumped this under my scenario, just my own um, background as someone who I would consider um, a fairly strong uh, bilingual person. My first language is Tohono O'odham, and um, uh, it's a language that I, I still speak uh, currently. And it's as growing up, it was a language of the home uh, and all social settings in the home. Uh, as you can tell by the generation that I'm from, um, I had parents who did not speak English, and many of you are in the same uh, case. Uh, the ladies I was sitting with over there when Ine said, mentioned something about people that had been in the field for a long time. We all claimed that she was looking at us and our gray hair, and so we felt self-conscious about it. But anyway, so we are of this generation where you have parents whose only language is the heritage language or the, the first language. And um, that was my own uh, background. Um, my parents had no English. My father had just a tiny bit just because he had to work outside the home. But he never, ever used it in the home at all. My father's second language was Spanish, again, because he had to work outside the home. And from where, where he worked, um, uh, his second language in uh, like I said, was Spanish, but he, again, he never, never used it in the home at all. Um, and I don't know, you know, why uh, he had that decision. It, you know, it just was not our language, so of course he kept it outside the home. Um, for me, school, oh, excuse me, English was introduced only in school, and that's where it belonged. And um, I've written about this on numerous occasions where my brothers and sisters and my cousins, we get off the school bus, you know, about a little less than a quarter mile from our house. And so you heard English on the bus, you got off the bus, and as you started walking home, I have described it as sort of like morphing over. You just made this change. It wasn't really, you weren't aware of it. You just sort of changed in all 
ways and as soon as you got to the front door of your house and your mother was going to be in there you know cooking or sewing or whatever she was doing late that afternoon you just automatically move back into that that language and that sort of world I guess if if you will um and that was that was um life um the separation for me at least was very, very consistent. Um, The one language was for the home, one was for school, and that that was it. And I think that kind of healthy distinction made uh, me uh, a fairly uh, uh, strong bilingual as a a young speaker of, of the two languages. The other thing, of course, that, you know, that I'm focusing on is, is sort of the success element of being bilingual. In my case, and also in my brothers' and sisters' cases, and my cousins, who we were all the same, uh, learning English uh, late and also in school, uh, we all had very uh, positive uh, school experiences. We all had successful um, uh, school uh, accomplishments. Um, we we wrote well. Uh, we read well. When we learned to read at home, we read a lot. We read mostly trashy stuff, but they say it doesn't matter what you read as long as you're reading. Um, so we read a lot, you know, of these pulp uh, novels and comic books and trashy magazines and so forth. Um, and that built, you know, your literacy in that language. And um, it was just part of our lives, lives when we, once we became uh, literate. And I mentioned here only because I couldn't remember very clearly that I don't ever recall our parents saying anything negative about English. A lot of times, you know, if somebody might be speaking English too much around the household, and I've heard this, you know, with other um, families, for instance, especially the grandmothers, would get very mad. They get mad mostly because they weren't understanding what was being said. So if you're going to say it in English, don't say anything, you know, um, or stop using it. But I don't ever recall my parents ever saying anything bad about the English language, because um, I know if it ha- if it had occurred, I would I would certainly remember it. I have one of those kinds of memories from from childhood where those types of things really stick and make an impression on me, especially because of my work in in language and linguistics. Um, So anyway, so to an extent, that, of course, was a very positive um, experience in the home uh, with the English language. And like I said, even though we didn't use English in the home, but if somebody was using it, like I said, no one ever said anything negative about it. But we, we just sort of knew better not to use it just because we knew our parents didn't understand. Um, and as children, you know, we made accommodations for our parents all the time because that is what you were supposed to do. Uh, and as I mentioned already, we became literate. And this one, I think, is important. We became literate by, by, by excuse me, I became literate by choice in my first language. Uh, It wasn't required of me. I chose to do it as a young adult. I was about 19 or 20, something in that age. Uh, I was an undergraduate at the university, and I found some publications that were written in Oda, and I bought them, and I looked at them. I looked at the Oda text, and I looked at it some more, and my understanding then, this was before I knew anything about language and linguistic study, my, my understanding was that, well, if I can speak this language, I should be able to read it. I had these books, and I looked at them, and I looked at them, and it looked, you know, it made no sense at all. So then I figured out I had to have somebody teach me how to read and write. So I sought out. So, like I said, I did it by choice. I did it just to, to figure out what was in these little books. Um, and so that, for me, was a very positive thing. And you know, those of you who are working language know that. You develop literacy when, if you're teaching somebody language, you're supposed to provide the, the reading and writing after they have a base in the oral form. 
So for me, that wasn't a problem. And I know from many of you who are literate in your native language, you already had oftentimes that base of the oral form from learning at home and so forth. Oftentimes that's not the case with some of our, our young um, um, language learners currently. So that's an important element that sometimes is confusing. You know, people think they want to use writing, and we'll have that presentation later on about writing, and hopefully I'm not contradicting them, but, um, you know, that you do have to have a sound foundation or an understanding of the foundation of the oral form uh, and, the, and the writing part um, can come after that. And then, as I mentioned, uh, taking advantage of being uh, bilingual certainly happened for me. Um, my choice of going into the field of linguistics, uh, looking at all of them and its structure and um, teaching all of them and so forth became my career. Um, and then I extend into my other interest area, again, based on my knowledge of Autumn history and culture and practices um, of what I can, you know, provide to the public because there are limitations. I've incorporated that in poetry and, of course, uh, some of it is written in Autumn. And so, the, at least in my experience, the growing up bilingual in the two languages has been a very, very important part of my life in general, and of course, as you can see, by my career as well. Now, of course, we can't say that this is what will happen to young people as they learn second language learners. We cannot guarantee that, but it's certainly an option, and it's something that you can build students towards uh, as they become you know, um, more successful as second language learners uh, of their heritage or home language. So anyway, I just wanted to provide this um, sort of little um, scenario of my own uh, experience and sort of my, my life uh, as being a, a bilingual. And I know, like I said, there's many of you out there who have gone uh, or have a similar um, uh, experience. <clears throat> Okay, anyway, so the study that I wanted to take some things from, um, uh, the studies, like I said, is based on um, a work by um, our, our large uh, language shift study and uh, also some more recent um, publications. And um, the paper that I'm uh, referring to looks at different types of schools and children's success. So I'm just going to give a real quick overview and, and summary um, on some of the schools that they looked at. I'm not going to look at all of them. So, for instance, uh, Christine Sims and um, uh, Mary Eunice Romero Little um, uh, report on the ACMA and Coach T um, experience. In this case, the program uh, of the Heritage Language Learners, the, the students, are all in a community project that is, is not within the school. Um, and also, it's only um, uh, based on oral uh, teachings. And it's also based on the traditional calendar and traditional roles in tribal life. So you can sort of tell already, because some of you have probably programs that are um, similar to this, is that the assessment is very different. That is, it is it's, um, you're assessing what the children are learning based on, of course, what you are teaching them. If you're teaching them about, you know, traditional roles of male uh, in the kiva or uh, ceremonial practices and so forth, then if they're in the end, they're able to participate fully, you know, with the song and dance and, and other uh, things related to that aspect of the, um, the culture, then of course they have succeeded. They have been successful uh, based on the language plus, you know, the sort of the applied components, that is the cultural aspects. 
So if you're looking at, you know, sort of the outcomes of language learning, these types of programs are very, you know, very internal. You, the, the teachers have to know what they are looking at as far as the children's success. So these types of programs, you can't look at scores. You can't look at numbers. They are irrelevant. Any kind of national, even uh, local uh, kinds of assessment make no sense for these kinds of programs. So you have largely descriptive kinds of um, um, assessment you know, reports, for instance, especially if they are funded programs. And I know in the case of my colleague, Mary Eunice Romero, they claim not to uh, um, uh, accept external funding uh, so that they are not, you know, uh, responsible for, the, for what the external uh, group wants them to do, which means things like assessment um, uh, outcomes. So um, this is sort of a, a not, not a unique case, it's just a different kind of case about uh, looking at the children's success based on learning or studying their heritage language. There are classic studies out there already, and two of the big languages, of course, are Hawaiian and uh, Navajo that people have looked at, that uh, researchers have looked at. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about those two. Um, in the case of, the, uh, of Hawaiian, we all know that because they have been around now for uh, almost 30 years and that they have built in their language and language immersion um, uh, schooling from pre-K um, to college, they are able to provide some long-term testing uh, assessments um, regarding uh, the student's success. Um, some of it is not fully, you know, uh, available uh, at this point. Most of the Hawaiian uh, examples of their student achievement has been based on what they call descriptive. That is, we get things like, like what I have up on the screen, that the students have... Um, uh, surpassed that of Native Hawaiians enrolled in English, English uh, medium uh, schools uh, and so forth. We see, have seen a lot of those types of, of reports um, and I know they have started to do and uh, follow children uh, to give more um, uh, quantitative um, measurement. But overall we know that from the Hawaiian case that children's uh, performance uh, in all areas of, you know, all the different subject matter in schooling, um, they have um, succeeded even though they have been primarily been given the information in the Hawaiian language and oftentimes the testing is in English, not in, in Hawaiian, uh, especially for standardized testing. But nonetheless, they still give us information, lots of descriptive information to say that learning a heritage language does not affect learning English, nor does it affect their success in all of the standard um, subject areas in school, meaning math, science, English, and reading and writing in English, for instance. <coughs> I'm sorry if the text is kind of small for those of you sitting in the back for this one. Um, this one is a classic study, and this is one of those studies that actually did a quantitative measurement of Navajo children in an immersion school at Fort Defiance. And the reason they were able to do that is because they had a significant number of students uh, matriculating in language immersion programs at the time. And so they were able to be tested over, um, you know, a period of time. And so uh, the study was in 1995 by Holmes and Holmes, our friends, um, Agnes, and, uh, the late Agnes Holm and uh, her husband, Wayne Holm. Um, and so they looked at English reading uh, assessment 
of the Navajo children who were in uh, an immersion program, and they say their outcome shows that they, uh, their test outcome was the same as students in mainstream English uh, classes. Also, the assessment of, of Navajo language, of course, their uh, scores were higher than the ones in, in uh, regular English, which sort of makes sense. Um, English writing, which surprises everyone, and this is also the case for the Hawaiian, uh, the students in the language immersion class at Fort Defiance, their English writing assessment scores were better than the students in um, mainstream English uh, classes. And we hear this one over and over again. Um, standardized uh, math tests were substantially better than mainstream English uh, students. And standardized English reading tests, it says, slightly behind but catching up with mainstream English um, students. So the study is, is a long, uh, long one. It has lots of other information, but this is part of their, their summary. But uh, like I said, these are the ones that you'll find consistent with programs that have been around for, for uh, more than five years. And um, uh, I'll say a little bit uh, more about that uh, towards the end uh, regarding the length of, of language programs. <clears throat> Other points that I want to make regarding um, language programs, and to me, this was, I list some of these from uh, the one paper that I mentioned earlier, to say that for those parents who, and like I said, if they are actually out there, um, why not to fear your, your language immersion classes for your, your children? Um, and that is, one of them is that <clears throat> um, heritage language programs, and we say academically rigorous, that a, a good language uh, program um, is a very, um, of course, we know, a very effective alternative to English-only uh, schooling. And those of us, well, uh, uh, Arizona is notorious, of course, for, for English only. So we're continually pushing, pushing this. Um, language immersion programs develop bilingualism and often biliteracy while enhancing the student's academic uh, achievement. So these things are going on, so they're all important things. They're all important things that you want for your children. Um, I would think you would want for your children. And this is, I think, the most important uh, finding from all of the uh, literature out there on uh, learning a heritage language or learning your native language, that it does not impede or does not get in the way of the English language. Way back when, I remember, maybe 20 years ago, uh, well, especially with the English-only uh, policies floating around, maybe that was 30 years ago, you know, we, were, we always we used to say things like, you know, well, English is like, it's like a weed. It'll grow anywhere. You know, make the, you know, it, it's difficult for it to grow, and it'll still grow. It'll come. You know, it is very hard to, to avoid it. Um, so learning a heritage language does not, you know, get in the way of um, learning English. Um, let's see... Okay, one of the other elements that I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> uh, successful evaluation of indigenous um, heritage language programs worldwide, that is being able to look at the impact, especially the impact of student success who are in, in say in the case of language immersion programs, um, you have to look at the, the time that is spent on learning a language, whether it's, you know, in the school or community. Um, and that, that, time, that, time and, and, uh, that time spent in learning the language is not lost to English or learning English. It's going to happen. Um, 
And I recall some time ago, of course, when the Hawaiians first started their, their immersion programs, one of my colleagues asked them right away, do you let your children watch TV? Because we think that that is, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest uh, uh, and significant impacts of um, children's exposure to English. And they said, yeah, the children can watch TV. We just regulate it just like any parent would. You know, you can't watch too much. You can't stay up late watching TV. And they allowed the children to watch English um, TV at the same time as they were in um, uh, language immersion uh, classes. And, uh, you know, the, the Hawaiian children learning Hawaiian as a first language were also being exposed to English. It was just not enforced or allowed in, in the school setting. So that kind of sounds familiar, like I said, to my own upbringing of being bilingual. You know, they're sort of um, um, uh, separate and away from each other and, and serve di different um, uh, purposes. <clears throat> there are other findings too, as well, regarding um, success of children in language immersion classrooms or children learning their heritage, class, uh, heritage language. And that it, it does take time to become a good speaker, depending on the method that you are, are using. And it can go anywhere from five to seven years. And so oftentimes, in order to get, if, if you're interested in outcomes, you know, how successful is a child that's been in a program, they have to have spent time in a program. And it has to be consistent. That is, your child can't be like, um, uh, do uh, kindergarten uh, immersion and then first grade, they're not in immersion, and then second grade, they go back into immersion. That, that doesn't, uh, that's where things get messed up. That's where the numbers hurt us uh, if you're looking at heritage language learning. Um, so that means that language programs should be designed to fit, you know, uh, this time frame or this type of time frame. And then, of course, um, becoming literate in, in the, the heritage language is, is, is quite complex, very complicated. Um, and one outcome we've seen already over and over again, that becoming literate in, in the heritage language benefits becoming uh, literate in English. It's more helpful that way. For some reason, it doesn't work the other way. If you're literate in English, it doesn't help you with your native language. It, that's a very uh, interesting phenomenon, the way the brain works. And I see this happening over and over again, even with un young university students. Um, I'll have um, young Adam students uh, from the reservation, let's say, and they might be limited speakers of the language and they want to study it um, on their own or for, for, for that, whatever reason. And once they start studying Odam, and you know, like if you're a freshman, you also have to take your English classes, classes and composition and so forth at the same time. I've had an, um, every year I, I'll, I'll hear this from my Odam students who are studying Odam and they're, you know, learning a little bit about you know, how we say certain things in autumn, the structure of autumn, you know, you can say it this way, you can say it that way, some people say, and the organization of the language, for instance, because we do look at it uh, from a linguistic point of view sometimes. And so they'll, for them, sometimes this light will go on. This light will go on, but over in their English class, because they say, what we learned in autumn helped me figure out what was going on in English. And, and they're also happy because they were very frustrated, in, you know, trying to look at this, you know, English um, and that understanding a little bit more about all of them helped them sort of see, especially if you're looking at the contrast, the difference in the two languages. And so I've seen it only on this really tiny scale, but you see it all the time when you have true bilingual true people who are looking at their own language that they can, you know, make very significant insights into English because of what they know about their own language. And that's a plug for linguistics. You know, uh, linguist, uh, being a linguist who also speaks their native language, one of the things that, that I was told um, when I first went into linguistics was that 
I have the benefit of, you know, being a native speaker and that I have insights and especially intuition, but mostly insights into my language that no one will ever have if they're looking at, at it as a, a, an outsider. And that certainly is true, but also I know that what happens is that I see English differently as someone who is a speaker of, the lang of my own language, but also an investigator of my own language. So it's, it's a very rich and, and um, uh, complex, you know, uh, triangle that happens with literacy, but I think we'll hear a little bit more about um, uh, writing and, and uh, the aspects of writing a little later today, but it's, it's an interesting area. Then there's this, these other general findings, and many of us know about them already, and some of you have gone through this uh, experience. Um, that historically, regarding uh, our heritage language, that you're either, that you're forced to make choices. And you shouldn't be. There's no reason you should be forced to make choices. And so you see this explanation, you know, you either speak English and succeed, or, or you speak the her heritage language and become a failure. That's what we've been told. And it, sadly, it sounds like it's still perpetuating itself or someone is perpetuating or certain groups are perpetuating or else we are, like I said, we are doing it to ourselves again. Um, so this is, like I said, uh, out there. Um, other findings is that, of course, we all know that well-designed and implemented uh, programs um, show that this you know, kind of choice giving um, to, be, to be wrong and of course damaging not only to the student success but to those of us who are the language teachers and sadly for those of us like that list that Jerry mentioned, those of us who are um, you know, uh, designers of the, the language programs for instance or are those of you who are the parents, grandparents, resource people, uh, cultural resource people in your schools and in your communities. It's all very, very um, uh, damaging to the whole population uh, involved in, in the whole endeavor of um, promoting the heritage language. So, like I said, it's out there, but you know how, how hard it would be to really identify uh, groups to talk to? Because sometimes, you know, when you do a a survey, whatever, you know, a lot of times people tell you what you want to hear. <clears throat> and of course, finally, our challenges. We always have challenges, and you can see, unfortunately, they look the same. We've seen this, I've seen them 20 years ago, 25 years ago. We're still there, and I know many of you will agree with me, these challenges are still there. I was just talking to some of the ladies here earlier this morning, the issue of getting proper training for your teachers, your language teachers, uh, materials development, the same thing we hear over and over again at our Language Institute. We, we need this, we want this, we want the best for our, our classrooms and so forth. Um, this one, uh, <clears throat> selecting, excuse me, securing the um, ideological commitment that means um, that we all have to be sort of on the same page. We can't disagree um, too much. I mean, it's not that to, uh, I'm not saying that you can't disagree. It's just that we have to all be on the, the same page with regard to some, some of the large ideological things out there about language. That is, because I know for many years, for instance, in my own work with our Language Institute, we, we saw groups, uh, tribes for instance, or subgroups within the tribes who said, our language, is, our language is healthy, we have lots of speakers. And then you have another group within that same tribe that'll say, no, the language is not healthy, you know, we are having uh, you know, X number of uh, youth who are not learning the language and so forth. And the two groups, did not see eye to eye at all. 
And that's when we talked about, you know, sort of issues of, of uh, denial regarding the status of language. So, so an, an ideology like that, you know, sort of a, coming to some agreement about the status of your language, you, you have to be on the same page in order to move forward to, to remedy or um, continue what you are doing, of course, as long as it's beneficial. Um, of course, this one we hear a lot, financial commitment from your institution. I'm sure everybody's been there or there. Uh, that's one of, you know, those are very mixed. You know, we, we commend those um, institutions, your schools, whether they're public, uh, charter, uh, BIE, universities, tribal colleges, whatever the case might be, charter, yeah, charter schools as well, um, who make a commitment to uh, efforts in uh, heritage language uh, classes and promotion. And of course, the commitment that the tribes themselves make for those that are community-based, tribally-based language programs. Because that is, I think, one of the most important commitments that must be there. Even if there's a school one, it has to be there in the community and in the home as possible. And then, um, one of the, you know, maybe the, the healthiest um, ways of supporting heritage language and success of children is what they call grassroots or bottom-up language uh, efforts. Um, that is, that it has to come from the people themselves and on up into the other, you know, relevant institutions instead of what they call top-down, that is somebody else telling you what to do. We've, we know that that history, we've gone through that history, and that has not had the success that it should. It's been you know, an expenditure of a lot of people's um, time, energy, and lots of resources with very little uh, positive outcome. The ones that come from the community up um, are oftentimes more economical, and has the investment of the community people, and so that's where you start to see um, some very nice uh, successes. But those types of programs are, are quite few um, overall. Those uh, are the end of my slides, but I do want to, and I have a couple at the end, but it's just resources, and I'll show them to you in a minute. But one thing I do want to let you know is that, and the reason I didn't put it on a slide is because it's very, very new. <clears throat> and that is that there is a plan for a four-year study starting this year, 2012, of um, Native American education language, uh, it's called the Native American Education Language Immersion Study. And it's part of a larger study, but language immersion is one of them. It's going to be a national study and um, it has the, um, the Office of Indian Education and the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education as all participants. And there is a consulting firm, some of you might know it, it's called Windwalker Enhancing Indian Education Services. They are the ones who have the contract for the study. And I've been invited to be, been invited to be part of the, uh, the working group that's going to look at this uh, part of it. Um, so it all sounded very, very exciting, and I thought it's about time because it will be a national study look at, looking at the impact of Native American um, immersion programs and education in general. And like I said, it's, they projected it as a four-year study. And so we are called the TWG, the Technical uh, Working Group, and most of us uh, that have been invited to be on that one are um, some university-based, some tribal-based uh, uh, people in all areas of indigenous language work across the United States. So they contacted us in earlier this spring. We had one teleconference, and then after that, nothing. We didn't hear anything from them, and then when they finally contacted us uh, in September and said there's been a big shift in the study plan um, mostly because of funding. And um, so the plan, the, the large study has been 
uh, sort of downgraded a little, that is made smaller. The language immersion uh, study won't be as, as a significant part, but it'll still be there. Um, so the group has a meeting in Washington, D.C. in December, their first uh, meeting. And um, one of the documents they did give us early on was a literature review on language immersion activity across the United States, and they also included uh, New Zealand. I, um, um, I'm not sure why the New Zealand study was there, but um, anyway, the thing is, though, with this project, we, you know that when a federal organization is going to look at success in Indian education, they're going to be looking at numbers. As I mentioned already, some of the success information regarding learning a heritage language, say from the Hawaiian and Kochiti and, and Akama, those are descriptive results that they have documented on themselves, which is good for all of us. It's good for their project. The federal study is want to look at things that, like I said, is more uh, what they call experimental or quasi-experimental studies. That is where you have to have a control group and, you know, some of you may have been already involved in things like that. Most of the language immersion studies have not been that kind of study. And I know some of you have been, have either carried some of them out um, um, or have you know, been a part of them. Um, so some of the studies that are out there now won't provide as much data as, you know, you would like it to. Um, so one of the other, uh, I think, impact, which is slightly, I don't want to say negative, is, is that whole issue that some of the language immersion programs are not long enough with the exception of the Hawaiian. You know, we have few in, in the mainland U.S. that have been going on for a number of years, but most of them have not been going on for a long time. And most of them only serve lower grades, that is pre-K through three, pre-K through six, or something like that. And oftentimes those language immersion programs are sometimes identified as volunteer programs, that is, they're not like official programs. So sometimes they cannot be counted as programs based on federal um, guidelines and so on. Another thing is that oftentimes language immersion programs, whether it's in the school or the community, um, have small numbers in them. The classes are small which makes sense for those of us who are language teachers. Your group should be small. So if you have too small a number in those programs, they have no power with regard to showing numbers, if that's what they're going to be looking at. So the benefit of having a good language immersion program, which, like I said, oftentimes is small, it's community-based maybe, it's successful, will oftentimes have not even be a blip, you know, on the screen. So I think those of us, and I think those of us that are in the um, part of the working group will fight for the, the programs that are successful because they are small, you know, they are uh, oftentimes community-based or at the lower grades where, you know, we have the, the understanding that you... Um, you're more successful with language learning at early ages and as, as children and babies and so forth. So all of that has to be accounted for. But right now the literature is looking at um, the potential of, of um, measurable studies. So we'll see where that goes. And like I said, it's just, just starting and it's already you know, kind of fluctuating um, as far as its overall plans are concerned. <coughs> and uh, it will be a four-year study, so I'm sure some of you in your language programs will um, be a part of it if you have literature out there already or else will be uh, visited by someone in the next four years or so. In my own work, <clears throat> especially with the Language Institute, our Language Institute, 
We have, well, we have wonderful people that come to take courses with us and get training and so on. But one of the, one of the missing elements is that are the studies, the documentation of what you all have been doing, uh, what you found successful. Um, a lot of that is, is missing. I know that you all do the documentation, the assessments and so forth, um, the collection of your, your literature and your products if you're a federally funded program where it's mandated that you have to do that as your final report, for instance. But otherwise, if you're not, um, you know, have substantial funding and so forth, oftentimes you just go from sort of year to year and, and uh, with little or no documentation of your practices, especially of your outcomes and your successes. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's just another, well, I don't want to call it burden. That's another responsibility that might be placed uh, on some of you. And it oftentimes is simply just a choice that might be given to you as the person in the classroom or the administrator of that particular program. So I know there's this big gap in our whole uh, work in teaching heritage languages um, at any level. And I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. You know, I've been teaching the autumn language class for many, many years, and I never thought to look at, you know, sort of the impact and outcomes of doing things like that. Um, with our Language Institute, it's a little bit different, you know, because we have other languages represented there. We've done some reports on the, on the Language Institute, but our practice at the Language Institute is not to do research on the teachers and language um, resource people that attend ALDI because that's not the reason they're there. So I just see and hear all the great things that are going on, but we have not been documenting it um, unless we are asked to by the, the, the individuals or, you know, that represent a particular program. Um, we simply do summaries and reports, and, and that's the extent of it. So anyway, so you can think about that. And like I said, it's a, it's a big chore. It's a big responsibility to, to look at yourself and to evaluate your program and your outcomes and so forth um, among all the things that you have to do uh, in your daily work uh, with your program. Um, but anyway, like I said, it's um, an area that is, is missing that kind of, of uh, documentation. And I think it's just good <clears throat> for external groups to know what you're doing, but also um, for yourself, because things like that, you know, those of you that have good programs, successful programs, know that you need to do a, sort of a little evaluation, assessment midway through your program, you know, so you can change midstream if you need to, and that just helps make your program and your efforts um, that much better. So. That kind of concludes my uh, comments, but let me just throw up on the screen uh, some resources. And you can see these are the reports and articles and book chapters um, based on the large um, native language shift study um, by Dr. McCarty Romero and myself. And then later we added a graduate student uh, from ASU um, as one of our co-authors. And these are just um, uh, reports from different parts of the large study because it was a long study. So you can, you know, find these in your, your libraries and, and so forth. <clears throat> just a few more. And, and um, later on, uh, I promised Ine I'll clean up this, these slides because uh, I don't have good references on them uh, and make it available to anyone who wants it, if you want it at all. Um, other recommended sources, again, uh, the ones from our study and ones from our friend, my colleague, uh, Lysi Wyman, who's also at ASU, and her colleague from, her colleagues from Alaska. Currently, there's lots of activity in the area of uh, youth and language study, and Dr. Wyman is one of them. One of our friends here, Sheila Nicholas, is another one. Um, and... Um, um, Mary Eunice Romero is another one who's looking at um, youth, native youth, and language study and language learning, and of course, um, their successes with that experience. So I think those are all of them. So, 
Okay, thank you.